often training and development is taking, taking place inside of organizations, inside of a professional setting, and on adults. So we need to think about how adults learn differently than kids. So that's the subject of today, how adults learn. So let's start uh, with a few basic laws of learning. We're going to go over three. Oh, let me grab a pen that works. So, we're going to lay down three laws of learning. The first is the law of effect. The law of effect suggests that people learn better in situations where they're comfortable, and they learn better in under, which, uh, under conditions that reward them. So, why is this important to us? As a trainer, control your environment so that learning can best take place. So, as we got into a little uh, last lecture, Sometimes there can be just physical needs like hunger that are distracting. Sometimes there can be environmental distractions or people coming in and out. So finding a way to control that environment follows the law of effect. If you can make them comfortable, they're more likely to learn. The other side of that is if you can find reward mechanisms, uh, it gets people excited. We're much like Pavlov's dogs. Um, we, we respond to treats, right? Uh, we can be conditioned. If something happens and we get a treat, we'll do it again so we get another treat, right? Uh, we're pretty simple. Um, and the law of effect is, uh, is, is part of that. The second law of learning that I want to get into is the law of frequency. The law of frequency suggests that we learn stuff that happens over and over. Go figure. The movie that you watch a dozen times, you can repeat every word word for word, right? And that's because it happens over and over. Uh, this is a, um, it's a dangerous road, right? You know how they say practice makes perfect? Even your book will say practice makes perfect. It's actually more true that practice makes permanent, right? What we do frequently are the things that we learn. And sometimes what we're struggling with as trainers is that someone has done something frequently and they've done it the wrong way, or they've done it in a way that we don't want them to do it anymore. So sometimes we're struggling against this frequency reality. We have a person who has done something frequently in a, in a way different than the way that we're training them to. Uh, so you've got to find another way of getting that frequency uh, reset um, so that their, their focus is on where you want it to be. So from a training perspective, it's important to know that while you don't want to bore the people that you're training, you also need to provide information in a way that uh, is repetitive enough that it will sink in. The last law that we're going to cover is the law of association. Pardon my spelling and my handwriting, it's pretty bad. Um, the law of association is that we learn when the thing that we're learning is related to something that we already know. That makes sense. So as a trainer, one of the things that you'll often be faced with a challenge of is finding out the previous knowledge that a group of people have uh, has and then finding ways to reference that knowledge to bring it in so that that old knowledge can shed light on new knowledge. Use examples, make analogies, uh, speak to the world uh, that, that they live in. Uh, it is important to note that just in the way the frequency can sometimes bite you, because sometimes they've frequently done the wrong thing, sometimes association can bite you. Oftentimes, once we associate the new thing that we're learning with an old thing, we go, ah, it's just this, like this other thing that I've learned. The danger in that, though, is sometimes it's not just like the thing that we, we already know. Sometimes it's different. So there are some times that you need to fight the associative power of the people in your training uh, lessons because in a way, once they associate it, then they've learned it that way, like the old way. But if it's not that way and you need to teach them a new way, sometimes you need to fight off that pushing that explanation down on what it is that they happen to be learning. All right. so. How are adult learners different than kids? Take a second and think on that. How is an adult learner different than a kid learner? Certainly the laws, uh, the laws of learning apply to both, right? Um, kids are going to be influenced by affect frequency and association, just like adult learners. But 
that they got in a moment. How is an adult going to learn differently than a kid? The first, and very important, is that adults need relevance. Adults really refuse to learn things that aren't relevant. They need it. They need the thing that they're learning to be relevant. A kid, uh, they don't really even know whether or not the thing that they're learning is relevant. And very often we have so many controls on them that they're not in a position to be making relevant demands at all. You ask your calculus teacher, how is this ever going to be useful? And they didn't really have to provide an answer. But I'm here to tell you that if you sit down in training and you've got a group of adult learners and you cannot answer the question, why do we need to be here? Why am I sitting in this room? Why am I listening to you talk? If you don't have an answer to that question, you're sunk. There's really no chance that they're going to pay attention. And part of it is because uh, our brains are kind of hardwired to learn when we're younger, uh, but the, uh, that elasticity, it, it sets in because as adults, uh, ostensibly we've learned a lot of what we need. Now, we're, we're not ignorant once we're adults. We're still capable of learning. It's just that uh, our, our, our minds are set for the performance of, of our knowledge, not continued acquisition. Uh, so part of that is that you need to kind of prove that relevance in order to do that work of learning or relearning a thing that they could actually just be out doing. Another thing that is different is that adults bring experience. to the classroom. They, uh, they have been around, right? And unlike a kid who needs a lot of the context explained, who's going to need a lot of help with application, an adult learner has probably done some of the stuff that you're talking about already. They may have been in other trainings covering the subject for before. They might have studied it in school. But they're bringing a whole lot of experience. And even if they haven't explicitly sat down and thought about the thing that you're training them how to do, they still have years and years often uh, of really hands-on, useful knowledge that they have drawn from their lived experience. Uh, so even if they haven't explicitly studied something, they probably still have thought about it as it's come up in their day-to-day -day life. Now, from, from a training perspective, this is very valuable. Adult experience is one of the neatest things about training adults. You're not just walking into a bunch of blank slates. You're walking into a rich uh, uh, world of knowledge. And in a way, a trainer of adults is a facilitator of the information, knowledge, and theory that you as a trainer is bringing, but also of the information and experiential resources of the learners that are in the room. So it, it becomes this opportunity for collaboration. The experience can also be, I wouldn't say a pitfall, but a challenge. Because if you're teaching something and it, uh, it uh, challenges or contradicts something that somebody has learned from their experience, it puts you in a very difficult situation because who are they going to trust more, their experience or some trainer who got brought in for four hours? Maybe their experience. So at times, uh, your <laughs> being disrespectful of their experience is probably going to sink you too. Uh, you're not likely to get very far or win a lot of friends. Uh, so pay, pay attention to the things that they know and try to draw them uh, as resources instead of uh, seeing them as challenges. The third way, important way, I think that adults are different um, is that they tend to have a problem-solving orientation to learning. They don't see subjects the way a kid does, right? A uh, kid's got, this is science, this is math, this is English, this is art, uh, mostly in part in the way that our education system is structured. Adults kind of come at it from a more problem-solving perspective. I have a need, and I can't meet it with my current information needs, so I go out and I learn. Because of that, adults uh, are often very uh, driven to learn uh, what it is they're learning. They're motivated by that problem, and they see, oh, I, I have this need. 
Now, knowing that adults are often problem-solving oriented in their learning, imagine what it's like to teach someone who doesn't think that there's a problem. It might be problematic. You might not have very much success teaching an adult who doesn't think that there is a informational or training need that they, that they have. Uh, if they don't think that there's a problem to be solved, uh, you might find it more difficult to teach. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it needs to be relevant, they bring a lot of experience, and their orientation is that of problem solving. So, having discussed in general how adults learn, it's worth asking, do all adults learn the same? And of course the answer is no. Right? There are all different kinds of learning styles. I'm sure you've uh, learned before of the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. I, I won't even put it on the board, you know it. Visual learners learn by seeing, right? They learn by looking at models or examples. They learn um, by uh, pictures, images, videos, things like that. That's a visual learner. About 30% of learners are visual. Then we move on to auditory uh, learners. Auditory learners learn through hearing. They learn through saying. They learn uh, you know, by listening and processing uh, information. They're not going to pick something up as uh, quickly reading. Rather, if it's read to them, they're more likely to learn. So that's an auditory learner. And then, of course, there's kinesthetic learners, and they learn uh, by engaging their bodies. They learn by uh, doing, right? And then, um, so the biggest category is visual learners, and then uh, auditory and kinesthetic, they're uh, uh, smaller percentages. And then there's the sort of fourth category, which is a mixture of the other three. So that's a mixed style. About 30% of people are mixed, which is, is to say that they learn visually, auditorily, and uh, kinesthetically. So uh, knowing that, uh, right, you probably learned it all in grade school. There are different strategies to teach uh, different people with different learning styles. Um, there are a few more distinctions in learning styles other than that very classic distinction, and I'm going to go over those, and then at the end we'll discuss why it's worth knowing uh, different learning styles. So one uh, important dimension uh, is this question of time. Not everybody learns at the same uh, pace. And that's not just to say that some people learn faster than others. It's more to say that some people experience time differently and need time to be structured differently in order to learn. So on the one hand, we've got very impulsive learners. And those are people uh, who try to uh, learn as much as they possibly can in the shortest amount of time. Uh, they uh, want to so soak everything up very, very quickly. Uh, they tend to scan, you know, if you assign them a chapter, oh, they're scanning it, they're looking for keywords, they're drawing stuff out, they're putting stuff together. Uh, impulsive learners can cover a lot of material, but on the flip side, they might do it slightly sloppily, they're likely to miss the nuances. Um, so, that's, uh, that's that. On the other side, we have reflective learners. And a reflective learner is the opposite. A reflective learner uh, is very intentional about uh, what they're paying attention to. They're trying to process as they're reading. They're uh, de uh, deliberate uh, as they're moving through. They're not going to cover as broad um, of, a, of a scope, but they're going to have a, a better, more nuanced understanding of, of each thing. Now, very often, our training sessions are set up impulsively or reflectively, you can structure all kinds of, uh, you can structure a training session in all kinds of ways. In 10 minutes, how much information do you get through? How many ideas do you cover? Some people will bam, 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 they'll go through as much stuff as possible. PowerPoint bullets are flying all over the screen. Uh, they, they get through a whole subject, right? And in 15 minutes, they might cover the subject of how to give a presentation, right? There's also more reflective styles, which slows the pace down a bit and doesn't say shoot to get 17 different ideas out. Um, they, 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 they pick a smaller scope uh, and, and they not only define it, not only say what it is, but they reflect on it, right? Um, to turn, turn it and look at it in different ways. Uh, and 
understandably, impulsive learners may be more interested in an impulsive teaching style and reflective and reflective. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one distinction. Another it concerns information processing. And uh, we have another distinction. On the one hand, we have what are called whole part learners. Basically, a whole part learner is somebody who starts with the whole and then splits that whole up into parts in order to understand it. So some people need, they need to know the big picture. They need to know why they're learning the thing that they're learning, what it is. And once they get that whole down, right, the big idea, then they're interested in schema or, or structures that pull that um, general idea down into a more specific set of subcomponents. Right? Uh, so they take an idea and they split it apart to understand. On the flip side, there are part whole learners. Okay, that's supposed to say whole. There are part whole learners. <laughs> and a part whole learner uh, basically starts on the other, the other side. They say, okay, so here's this thing, and I'm learning it. Okay, I got it. And here's this thing. And I'm learning it, okay, I got it, and this, boom, and you put all those together, and oh, aha, I see how this all fits. So a part whole learner doesn't have the same need to see the big picture in the beginning. They're more content focusing in on the little details and, and chunking those details together to eventually see a grander picture. This stuff comes out in our teaching. I'm sure you've had teachers before who kind of say a little bit about this, a little bit about this, and then the end of the class, boom, they draw it all together, right? Other teachers spend 15 minutes up front explaining what we're going to say, why we're saying it, why it's important to know, what it is, its definition, and then after that fairly large introduction, then they get into the component parts. That would be the distinction between whole part and part whole. So, they chunk, well, they split. They split the whole into parts, they chunk parts into the whole. So, the last thing that we're going to cover as far as learning styles, um, you'll find in your book this guy named Kolb, he has a set of learning styles. I prefer uh, McCarthy's terminology, <coughs> and uh, there are four. They're innovative learners. And an innovative learner is somebody who likes to watch, observe, um, they like to imagine uh, ways things uh, get together. They're analytic learners. An analytic learner is somebody who's interested in clear, concise, logical explanations. They trust experts uh, and they like everything to make sense and fit together. They're common sense learners. And they demand that things are practical, uh, that they have uh, immediate utility, and uh, that they're uh, very relevant. And then the last, um, what does it say? Oh, dynamic learners. The last are dynamic learners. And a dynamic learner is somebody who learns uh, by doing, uh, by getting in and, and getting it done, uh, like kinesthetic. Now, why does all of this matter? This is actually the most important part of this uh, entire uh, lecture. It's good to know that there are different learning styles because sometimes we're ignorant to the fact that there are different learning styles. Most of us have only ever lived one life and it's ours. I've met a few people who remember past lifetimes but they didn't remember them very clearly so they hardly count anymore. I know how I learn, and I've never really learned like somebody else has learned because I've never been somebody else. And when we teach, with that, if we don't think about it, we tend to teach as though the people who are sitting out in our audience are all exactly like us. And that's problematic because not everyone is like us. So if you're a real impulsive learner and you like to survey stuff real quick and move through it, 
That'll be great for all the other impulsive learners, but the reflective learners in the crowd are going to be left wanting more, wanting to have spent a little bit of more time uh, tossing the idea around and thinking about it. If you're a whole part learner and all you ever do is start with the big picture and then break it down into component parts, it's going to work great for the whole part learners, but the people who uh, need to fit things together in order for them to make sense, uh, they're going to be left out in the cold. If you're a common sense learner and you sit down and everything has an immediate application, sometimes you're going to kill that creative and imaginative process that an innovative learner is really going to need. And if you're spending tons of time explaining the logical connections between things, sometimes you're going to bore the crap out of the dynamic learners who need to actually get in and do something. So, if it's important to meet people where they're at, then we, we need to think intentionally about our training processes. So, there are a couple of strategies. One is called matching. I suppose we can write these down. So there's a thing called matching. And that is when you try to match your teaching style with the learning style of the people that you're trying to train. Matching, match the teaching style to the learning style. Now, it's ideal because people take up information best met at their learning style, and so if you can match your teaching style to their learning style, they'll learn the best. So that's great. The drawback is that oftentimes you're in a group that has all different kinds of learning styles. So in order to truly match, you would need to go through and somehow survey or analyze your, uh, your, your training people and then break them off into groups based on their learning style and then have a bunch of different training capacities all focused on them. So you might be making six or eight different training modules and you need six or eight different trainers in order to do it. And I'm going to suspect that most of the time you're not going to have the time to do that, or you're going to have the training resources in order to meet that need. So there's also the idea of bridging. And bridging is basically teaching from your teaching style and trying to ask them to meet you where you're at. It's the opposite of matching. So matching is coming to where they are. Um, matching your style, um, whereas bridging is basically demanding um, or encouraging that they bridge their learning style to meet with your teaching style. So, on the one hand, it's a little easier, right, to, uh, to put together. And there is something to be said for the power of teaching people to learn in new and different ways. Our learning styles are not static. In a way, they're based off of other successful learning things. Now, certainly, it has to do with our, our, our makeup. Some of our minds are built differently. But it's not only biology. Sometimes it's also past success. And you can get great success out of bridging if you can actually get them to learn. Because not only do they learn the thing that you were trying to teach them, but they also might learn a new way of learning, which is potentially invaluable, right? Now, so on the one hand, Brad, uh, bridging, on the other hand, matching, they each kind of have their flaws. So there's kind of like a, a, a third option, which is called uh, style, no, what is it called? Style flexing. And style flexing is rotating between learning, te uh, uh, learning styles. It's, it's teaching part of the, the training in one way, perhaps your way, and then segueing into a different learning style, perhaps their way, and then segueing into another learning style. And this way, not only do you get the advantages of matching in that sometimes you're teaching straight to them, but you're also, at other times, uh, asking that they bridge and leave their comfort learning style and find you uh, at, at another learning style, which can also raise their confidence. Ideally, you would be able to 
get out somewhat similar information in a handful of different modes. That way, multiple people can learn. So you give a lecture, you've got a PowerPoint. Nowadays, it's very common for somebody to throw their hand in the air and say, can you get me that PowerPoint through email? Do it. Just because you don't think it's important doesn't mean that they might not be a visual learner, or it doesn't mean that they might be a reflective learner. And you want to burn through it, and you say, oh, I said everything, they should get it. But they might want to go through it slower and think about it point by point. So try to accommodate. Try to find different modes of instruction. Uh, I've been doing my best uh, uh, here in this class. Some of the stuff is uh, auditory. Some of it is visual. Some of it's pictures. Some of it's words. Some of it's real time. Some of it's click through. Uh, and I do that to kind of change things up, to make things interesting, and to not overly advantage one learning style over another. Now, you can go a little crazy uh, asking questions of what's the best way of teaching and what's the best uh, learning style to, uh, uh, to attend to. And frankly, you do the best with what you've got. But it is also important to keep in mind that if you never think about this stuff, um, you're probably only teaching to the people who learn like you. Uh, and that's not your job. It's your job to teach everybody, no matter how they learn. And that's the mark of a good teacher, who can assess the needs of the people that they're supposed to teach, but then also discover the way that those people meet their needs. Speaking to the experiences that they've had, meeting them uh, in relevant ways so that they can solve their problems. That's it.